Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with my TLC review, aka Heel Mania 2016. Bit of a spoiler alert, pretty much every heel won tonight with the exception of like one match, then there's the pre-show, but that doesn't really count. So let's begin. Pre-show match, American Alpha, the Hype Bros, and Apollo Crews taking on the VOD Villains, the Ascension, and Kurt Hawkins. Remember earlier this year when like, it looked like Kurt Hawkins was going to get some kind of push, like they did all these vignettes for him, and like he had these big promo time and everything, this delayed thing, kind of like what they did with Eva Marie before she got suspended, and now look at where Kurt Hawkins is. What a wild year of 2016 has been. I feel like we've seen this match a hundred times before since the brand split, where it's like whoever's not fighting for the tag titles at that particular time, just throw them all into a multi man tag match and that's all you gotta do and it's just so boring can we give these guys something else to do like have some teams feud with each other not having to do the tag titles like maybe a fatal four way for the tag titles something to get more people involved and just less time being wasted in these multi-man tags i honestly didn't pay too much attention to this match i did like the spot near the end where apollo cruz gave kurt hawkins a suplex to the outside on to all the people. That was really cool. I don't think I've seen that spot before ever, if not in a long, long time. Uh, American Alpha wins the match with the Grand Amplitude on the Simon Gotch, and the faces win. They always win these pre-show things. It's they, it's more of that predictability, more of that boring stuff with the pre-show stuff, with the tag division in SmackDown. Also, where were the Usos on this show? I know they lost the tag team turmoil thing a couple weeks ago, but like they were just kind of like conspicuous in their absence in this one. They're one of the better teams on SmackDown. They were nowhere to be found. Tag Team Championship match as Slater and Rhino defended against Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt, aka two of the most randomly put together looking teams of all time. Like somebody on Twitter uh, said earlier tonight, it was like if you skip ahead a year in universe mode. That's kind of what you got, the vibe you got with these two teams. Uh, there wasn't too much to this match really. I think it was one of the matches I saw that like didn't really like wow me or it didn't, didn't suck, but it wasn't like an amazing match either. I was thinking of watching this match, and this is kind of an aside. I don't know if anyone else noticed this or thought about this or if it matters, but like if you're Heath Slater, it's kind of cool to be like in this match where you're defending the tag team titles against, you know, Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt, two of the biggest stars on SmackDown right now. Considering a year ago you were Jobber Deluxe and you were almost never on TV, then in 2016 you get this really cool storyline where you're the free agent and then you're doing this thing. Even though you lose the belt tonight, uh, you know, I think it's still kind of, I would consider a career highlight. Maybe I'm alone on that one. The finish involves Harper shoving Randy Orton out of the way on the outside. Harper eats the gore, then Randy hits the RKO onto Rhino, and then that wins in the tag team titles. Orton is showing the trust is there between him and Luke Harper, the symbolic handing Harper the championship so Harper can pose with both the belts at the end. A really cool advancement for the Wyatt storyline. Again, probably not going to end amicably, or and still probably going to turn on Wyatt eventually at some point, but I like where this storyline's going. I'm very interested to see who's going to knock those two off their perks in the tag scene. I'm guessing American Alpha down the line, but for right now, I think them winning the tag belts is really cool, and like it moves things on past the Slater Rhino era. No disqualification match, Nikki Bella taking on Carmella. The war to settle the score, I hope. Uh, I think it's funny how this feud kind of turned into something more about John Cena than anything else. Like That was the whole focus of their feud by the end of it. Uh, honestly, this is actually a pretty fun match to watch. Uh, exceeded my expectations. My respect for Nikki went way up in this match, the way she took the kendo stick shots and ate the steps and did the big flying kick off the top of the barricade. Uh, Carmella, do as well, taking a lot of offense too, taking the kendo stick shots. She was fire extinguished to death. That was basically the finish, which was just drowned in fire extinguisher and then hit with a rack attack 2.0. Nikki Bella wins this uh, kind of short and sweet match. Carmella reveals at the end that it was actually Natalia who jumped Nikki at Survivor Series. I still am holding on hope for Eva Marie doing it all along. I don't. I think it's it's too it's too easy for it to be that cut and dry. It's too predictable for the Natalia to have done it. It has to be a, a diversion. The Intercontinental Championship belt defended in a ladder match. The Miz defending it against Dolph Ziggler for what they say is the final time between these two. We'll see how well they hold themselves to that standard. A great hype package before the match, uh, highlighting the feud to help show the history of the belt. I think that was just one of the best packages I've seen all year. Great job by the editing team at WWE. The first seven or eight minutes of the match, not even in the ring barely. It was all on the outside stuff. Um, crazy DDT onto the leaning ladder from Ziggler. Ziggler to Miz. The Miz showing some creative use of the ladder to attack Dolph Ziggler's leg throughout the match. I, I loved the figure four spot wrapped around the leg. That was, oh, I love like figure fours and submissions instead of using weapons, like wrapping around. That I loved spots like that every time and that was perfect. I loved it. These guys had a great match. I mean, it's very repetitive of me to say at this point. I've said it a million times so far this year, but I mean, these two guys 
rarely, if ever, have a bad match. I feel like they've worked each other so often now, they know each other at the back of their hands, so it's it's hard for them to have a crappy match. And every time I've seen them this year on pay-per-view and on SmackDown, they've always done a really good job. They've always had like the match or almost the match of the night. So kudos to them on this one. The match ends when, as many of my Twitter followers pointed out tonight, The Miz took Dolph Ziggler to Dick Kick City and retained the championship. So that's the end of the rivalry, apparently. A great way to end this long standing terrific rivalry over the belt you know even though there was a kind of a back and forth real quick with the championship a few weeks ago i still think this is a great way to help you know, legitimize the championship belt like i said before i said it with the women's title thing on raw it's like to me legitimacy of a championship isn't always how long you hold the belt it's like how often it's how badly the wrestlers fighting for it want it and you can see it with the miz and ziggler it really matters a lot to them uh they are so obviously going to have a confrontation between the miz and daniel bryan in ring uh, at some point it's so blatant now they're just like hammering it home it's so thick they're laying this on uh, maybe it'll happen at wrestlemania i saw somebody uh tweet earlier tonight that they're gonna have like an 18 second match at wrestlemania that'd be pretty cool but i mean it's yeah it's definitely building to something these the miz and daniel bryan their careers are going to be intertwined forever up next, a chairs match as Kalisto in his new year takes on Baron Corbin in his patchy, patchy pants and his patchy, patchy hair. Honestly, this match was much better and more exciting than I and a lot of people expected. I think this match was better than most people were going to give it credit for. People have been sleeping on Baron Corbin. I think he's a very underrated wrestler. I think the, mold, the, 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 the role he fits right now is very good. Just the bully heel. And I think he works fine. I, I, I haven't seen him have like a terrible match. And I think this match, like I said, much better than people expected it to be any right to be. Kalisto attacking Corbin like his life depended on it. Corbin doing a fair amount of selling for Kalisto. The chairs help kind of level the playing field. I loved the top rope senton from Kalisto onto Corbin into the bed of chairs in the ring. That was cool. The tope caught into the deep six on the floor was just an incredible spot. Ah, oh, it looked magnificent. I loved it. Uh, Kalisto going crazy on Corbin with the chairs by the end. And then the finish itself was just so brutal. Uh, Kalisto getting swatted midair by the chair and then gets hit with the end of days on the pile of chairs, and Corbin wins it. I mean, I'm comparing this last year to the Del Rio Swagger chairs match, which was fun and brutal in its own way, but I mean, it can't match the intensity and the excitement that this one had. If you're just comparing apples to apples, chairs match to chairs match from a year ago to today, I'd say this one was the superior one, obviously. I really enjoyed this match, and yeah, it defied my expectations. Tables match for the Women's Championship as Becky Lynch defends against Alexa Bliss. The the crowd was pretty dead for this match. It was the quietest they'd been all night, which is unfortunate when you consider this is one of the few matches on the card that had a considerable amount of heat going into it. This match, it was okay between these two. I think it was better than their Glasgow match, in my opinion, but there were some slow points in between like table setup things and some certain spots. There was one minor botch like in the last third of the match when like Becky was going for a run into the corner and there's kind of like bleh. I cringed so much when Alexa Bliss hit Becky with the DDT onto the upturned table. Not so much for Lynch, but for bliss because you saw how the small of her back land on the metal frame of the table kind of reminds you of like when wrestlemania 30 orton did the rko spot onto the table and his back just like hit the monitor or like you know uh, Shawn michaels his back hitting the casket royal rumble match 98 uh that sort of thing i don't i mean hopefully it's not that bad but it looked pretty sick just looking at that like if you've ever had lower back pain and you can just see that's like, oh just oh the finish comes when alexa trips becky on the apron catches her and power bombs her through the table onto the floor to become the new women's champion. And, and Mara Ranal says it was the biggest win of her embryonic career. Mara says some of the weirdest shit sometimes. Alexa winning the championship was a great move in my opinion. I think her body of work suggests that she's going to be a great heel champion. I think just her character in general, with or without a belt, is great for like a main event or a main female heel kind of gimmick. And I think that her with a championship is going to add to that considerably. Don't know who's going to be the next contender for the belt after after Becky Lynch if she doesn't drop to Lynch right away. But good move for Bliss. And between this match and the no DQ match earlier on between Nikki Bella and Carmella, good look for the women of the SmackDown. And really overall, a good look for the women of both brands. Because you had this show tonight, and you had Hell in a Cell, and you had Raw last week with Sasha Banks and Charlotte. You show these women are showing more, you know, it's a, it, maybe it's at the time of year, I don't know. The timing of it is very interesting, how all these matches are happening kind of really close to each other with like weapons gimmicks and stuff with these women's matches. I think they're showing that they're not just, you know, they've evolved so much just in the last five to 10 years in the style of women's wrestling. I think they're really showing that they can be on par with the men's, men's 
matches, and especially in terms of the weapon stuff. I think they bring it now. And so I think this last couple of months for the women's division has been very good. Main event time, TLC match for the WWE Championship as AJ Styles defends against Dean Ambrose. This match was not jam-packed from beginning to end. It started off slow, but then it built up over time. It went from being kind of a slow match to be like white hot near the end of it. My opinion on the match like really turned like within the first third or like, halfway through the match. This was a really fun match to watch overall. There wasn't like a cohesive story throughout the match. It was just like a never-ending, escalating series of stunts, like stuff on the outside, stuff with chairs, stuff with tables, stuff with ladders. Oh my God, it's going crazy. I mean, the coolest move of the match, possibly of the night, was everyone was tweeting about this. Everyone was talking about this online. The spot with, like, the uh, AJ Styles did the front flip out of the vertical suplex onto the bed of chairs. Really cool move. Ambrose putting the ladder on the table. The elbow drop off the top of the ladder onto Styles through another table was an insane spot. Oh my god, the, the moonsault the, into the reverse DDT onto the floor. That was great. Jesus, the springboard 450 through the table. I mean, this thing just went move for move. Better, better, bigger, better. It was, a, it was just crazy. It was insane. It was a lot of fun. Until... Out comes James Ellsworth selling his injuries better than most of the roster half the time, and he actually costs Dean Ambrose the match. He pushes him off the ladder, through the tables, Styles climbs the ladder, and retains the championship. What a wild ride. Finish aside, I thought it was a great main event. It was easily one of the best of the year, in my opinion, in the company. But the whole Ellsworth thing, it's like I watched Talking Smack after the show where he said it wasn't like heelish intentions. He's like, oh, I got AJ Styles' number. I'm going to beat him. Like, so <laughs> I'm just laughing because it's so stupid. I just want the James Ellsworth saga to end already. How long are they going to have to artificially inflate this Ambrose Styles rivalry? My final thoughts with TLC this year, I'm going to give it a B minus grade. I think every match on paper going into the show looked good to me. Some of the matches met my expectations. Others exceeded them. Uh, the women's table match was the only one that really bored me. Uh, and then the tag title match was just kind of there with the exception of the advancement of what they're doing with Orton and Bray Wyatt. I'm getting super sick to death of the lack of originality in SmackDown's tag team division. But past those things, I love the main event. It was an awesome main event match despite a very crazy finish with a potentially bad ripple effect. But I love the ladder match. Uh, the chairs match was way better than I thought it'd be. So yeah, overall, I'd have to give this one a B minus or possibly a B grade. Let me know what you thought about TLC in the comment section below. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.